Hmm. Hello, my friends. Uh, my name is Henry Kuto, but you probably already know that. And it is, at least in Ohio, it is cold. There is a chill in the air. Um, but that doesn't stop me from sitting by the campfire, hanging out with you guys, and telling some scary stories. So uh, we're going to have a good time because things may be kind of scary out there. But in here, all the scary is relatively safe and family friendly. So, you know, feel free to uh, sit down with your kids, have a good time. And I also want to mention our first call to arms. Please hit that share button, share it with your friends on Facebook. Let them know this is going on and that they can come and hang out and chat. Speaking of which, uh, I want to check out the chat. I also want to mention we have our overachiever of the night, which is Craig Cohen, who uh, went ahead and sent us a tip before we even started broadcasting. So thank you so much, Craig. Uh, tips are not required, but they are hugely appreciated. Um, let's see who we got in here. Uh, Jan Boyd, yay, I'm here too. Thank you, Jan. Tony Marr, my favorite night of the week. Mine too. I gotta tell you, today's uh, show, I actually was running late. I just got distracted by watching TV and stuff and I ran one errand, which is a big deal uh, for me. And uh, I actually was like rushing to be ready in time and it was like, it was pretty fun <laughs> to have to be somewhere on time and, and make it on time. So that was a lot of fun for me. Um, uh, Tony Marr said, wait, where in Ohio? I'm based uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Patrick Gunter, good to see you, Patrick. Craig Cohen, hello, good evening. Thank you, my man. Uh, let's see, Morgan Moore, and in typical Ohio fashion, it has also been thundering. That is true. At about five o'clock this afternoon, we had thunder and hail. Um, you know, so there you go. That's the kind of day we're talking about. Um, and I want to mention, wow, we've got a lot of people hanging out right now. So before I start the first story, I do want to mention again, hit the share button. Even if you're only going to be here for a minute, hit the share button and let people know that they can listen to some family friendly, scary stories and hang out, do something to feel like we're getting out and doing something. It's definitely helping me feel like I'm getting out and doing something. We've got lots of cool people in the chat. Uh, David DeNoyer said, wait, I thought this was a live stream of Creepshow 3. No, David, we would never be that something that scary. Um, Mark Shields said, already shared. Thank you, Mark. Um, so I suppose, uh, oh, Heather Fairchild said, Leah and I are in the house. Good to see you two. Uh, so I guess we're going to go to the first story. Um, I'm very excited because this is our third week doing uh Uncle Henny's Campfire Stories, and last week we were we were reading even more scary stories for sleepovers, which is a young adult uh, kind of storybook with lots of scary stories. Well, I have since, uh, that was a random book that I had bought, just a random book. So I decided to go all in and I've been obtaining all of the scary stories for sleepovers books. So we're gonna start with the original, the first one. And uh, the way these books work, it takes about two, four hours to read the whole thing. So we'll read about half of it today and half of it next Wednesday. And uh, when this is done, by then I should have more scary stories for sleepovers. And then we already read even more. And then I should have super scary stories for sleepovers and even more super scary stories for sleepovers. There are so many <laughs> scary stories for sleepovers books. And uh, all of them have a lot of, uh, of good times involved. I'll, oh, I want to mention uh, Jeff McClellan just tipped us. Thank you so much, Jeff, for your very generous tip. Generous? Generous tip. Um, it helps me buy these books. I'm buying them used. Um, uh, mostly on eBay or Amazon, and uh, I can't wait to read them with you guys. Uh, reading out loud is something I find extremely therapeutic, and as I want to mention now that we have 65 uh, concurrent listeners, these are family-friendly scary stories, so you can just curl up with your kids and rock out. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and start the first one right now. Tony Janot. Hello, everyone. Hello, Henrik. Hey, Tony. Thank you again for buying yourself a t-shirt. There are t-shirts available. David, uh, David DeNoyer will post in the chat any of your questions you ask. He'll answer them while I'm reading. So uh, he can tell you where to purchase t-shirts and things like that. But it's not all about sales. It's about some human connection time. So, oh, and Ray Searcy. Hey, all. Hey, Ray. Thank you for joining me again. All right. Make sure to hit share. <laughs> all right. Here we go, friends. The first story of our scary stories for sleepovers, the original book. Let's see. 
All right. The first story tonight is called The Hermit of Collins Peak. Ricky and his friends were telling Kurt, the new boy in the neighborhood, about the strange old hermit who lived outside of town. He's crazy, Ricky was saying. The other boys nodded. He lives in a shack over on Collins Peak. A shack? Kurt asked. I swear, said Ricky, holding up his hand. It's true, added Steve, Ricky's best friend. He built it against the side of the mountain with old pieces of metal and wood. Kurt shook his head. That's really weird. Who is this guy? Some of the boys shrugged. His name is Collins, said Sean. He's lived up there forever, as long as anybody can remember. That's why they call it Collins Peak. My grandma told me once that he had a sad story, said Nathan, but that's all she'd say. It's a sad story, all right, agreed Ricky. He's a crazy old man who lives in a shack, the rest of the boys laughed. What does he do up there, asked Kurt. Nothing, replied Ricky. He never talks to anyone. He never comes into town. We think he eats kids, said Steve. What? Kurt asked. It's true, said Ricky. He hates kids. Everyone at school knows it. His shack's at the end of a big field, and any time somebody sets foot on it, he comes screaming out of nowhere. Get out of here, yelled Sean in his deepest voice. He pulled his head out. He pulled his head down between his shoulders and limped around in a circle. You stupid kids, get out of here and leave me alone. If I catch you, I'll turn your backsides red, Steve added, and everyone laughed at that. Yeah, continued Ricky. Sometimes we dare each other to see who can get the closest to his shack before he comes out charging. Why do you say he eats kids, asked Kurt. Well, said Ricky, his voice dropping lower as he leaned toward Kurt. You never know where he is. He sneaks all over these hills, waiting for some kid to do something stupid, like wander in alone. Then it's all over. What happens? Kurt asked. He'll trap that kid, take him back to his shack where he cooks him slowly over a fire. Then he stores the blackened body carefully so it'll last him for his next few meals. There's a pit nearby that's filled with rotten bones of every kid who ever disappeared around here. Kurt looked at Ricky suspiciously. And how many kids is that? Ricky shrugged. Don't know, but you better be careful or you'll be one of them. At that moment, Sean grabbed Kurt from behind and yelled, Gotcha! Kurt squealed and jumped and the rest of the boys howled with laughter. Rotten bones, yeah right. Kurt smiled and shook his head. Okay, you got me. After the boys recovered, Nathan said, Who knows? Who knows why he really doesn't like us to get near his stupid shack. Maybe he's got some kind of treasure hidden there. Why else would he care about anyone coming around? Heck, he's been living in those hills for ages. Who knows what he's found? Maybe he's found some kind of gold mine. Then why doesn't he spend a lot of money? Demanded Sean. Maybe because then he knows people would come up there and kick him out guessed Steve. Maybe he had a partner and killed him to keep the gold for himself, Kurt suggested. They spent the rest of the afternoon making up wild stories about the old man. That night, Kurt asked his parents if they had heard about the hermit. His father shook his head, but his mother nodded that she had heard something once. Mrs. Beecham was telling me about him, she explained. He used to live in town a long time ago. His wife died giving birth to his only son. Then, a few years later, his son disappeared. Apparently, he went a little crazy after that. He built some kind of house up on Collins Peak, and he's lived there ever since. I hadn't heard that, Kurt's father said. Is he supposed to be dangerous? Mrs. Beecham didn't think so. She said he's lived there longer than most of the people have in this town. He's never hurt anybody. Ricky was telling me that he hates kids and chases them away whenever they come near his shack, said Kurt. His father laughed. I can see it now, some poor old guy living up in the hills. He must be a target for every kid within a hundred miles. He turned to Kurt. I'm sure Ricky is right. This guy has probably been pestered by kids ever since he moved up there. Why don't you just leave him in peace, okay? Kurt shrugged. Sure, Dad. He bent over his plate and paid close attention to his dinner. The next day, he couldn't wait to talk to his new friends. They all met at Steve's house, and Kurt filled them in on what his mother had told them. 
See, said Ricky, that just proves it. He probably hates kids because he lost his son. Let's show Kurt the shack, suggested Sean. I don't know, Kurt said. My dad said I should leave the old man alone. I think he feels sorry for him. Don't worry, said Ricky. We'll just go as far as the edge of the field. Then you can see what we're talking about. Kurt pretended to resist, but was soon headed out of town to Collins Peak with the rest of the boys. They walked to the end of Adler Road, which turned into a dirt trail winding its way into the foothills. Ricky led them to a point where the trail began to bend around the mountain. Just up around that bend, he said to Kurt in a low voice, is the, ma is the old man's field. When we get there, look toward the far end and you'll see his shack. They crept along the trail and gradually a field was revealed. It laid to the right of the trail and was surrounded by three sides, th surrounded on three sides by steep slopes. It was about as big as a football field and at the far end stood the hermit's shack. To Kurt, it looked as if the shack were crouched under the oak trees, waiting to pounce on an unsuspecting child. He had no idea how it was held together. There were all different kinds of si and sizes of metal sheets, aluminum siding, wooden planks, and pieces of plastic. It hunched up against the side of the mountain as if any minute it would push against the hill so as to lunge forward all the better. He lives there? Kurt asked in disbelief. That's right, said Ricky. Nice place, huh? Suddenly, the door of the shack swung open and the old man rushed out. Kurt figured he must, have, he must be more than a hundred years old. His body was thin and his bones poked through the holes in his ragged clothes. He had long white hair that stuck straight out and a scraggly beard that hung down to his chest. He looked anxiously around the clearing. The boys shrunk back into the bushes, peeking through the branches. Kurt felt as if the old man were looking straight at him, but nothing happened. The, the hermit began coughing, and even from where they were, Kurt could hear the horrible gasping. Then the old man ducked back into his hut. Ricky motioned to the others, and they backed away down the trail. Once out of sight of the field, they ran all the way back to Adler Road. Then they stumbled to a halt, chests heaving. See, said Nathan, he's one strange-looking old man. It sounded like he was about to die, said Ricky. The boys started walking again. They spent the rest of the day playing hide-and-seek in the overgrown weeds and bushes near the end of Adler Road. One morning, a few weeks later, Kurt was eating his breakfast when the doorbell rang. I got it, he yelled, and ran to the front door. It was Sean. Kurt, get dressed! Why, what's up? Kurt let Sean in and they went to his room. Guess what happened last night when Mr. Grafton was walking his dog? How should I know? Kurt was lacing up his shoes. What's going on? Mr. Grafton was walking that goofy German shepherd of his up on around Adler Road when the dog starts going crazy. So Grafton lets the dog go and it runs over to some bushes and starts barking. Yeah, Kurt prompted. He forgot about tying his other shoe. What was it? The old man! He had some kind of a heart attack or something. So Grafton got the police and an ambulance up there and they took the old man to the hospital. Wow, how do you know all this? asked Kurt. Sean practically did a dance. My sister works at the hospital. She told us at breakfast this morning. Is he, is he dead? Nah, but do you know what this means? W what? It means, said Sean, becoming very serious, that for the first time since I can remember, the old man is not at his shack. Kurt realized what Sean was suggesting and started to protest. Come on, Sean cut in. Ricky, Steve, and Nathan are going to meet us at Atler Road. Kurt stood up, chewing on his lip while he thought. Sean watched. Then Kurt grinned and threw his arms in the air like a champion boxer. Yes, he yelled. Let's go. The old man was dying, and he knew it. He opened his eyes and stared at the white walls of the hospital room. He hadn't been in a hospital since his son was born. He turned slowly and looked at the tube in his arm smiling bitterly. There was no use, but try and tell that to a doctor. Yes, he knew he was dying. He had known it since the coughing began nearly six months ago. First, he thought he had a slight cold or maybe bronchitis at worst, but the cough never went away. After the first couple of weeks, it felt like his chest was being ripped apart 
every time he coughed, and not long after that, he started coughing up blood. He felt himself falling asleep again. He was so tired. Then he remembered. The cave! He had to tell someone about the cave! He struggled into a sitting position and reached for the nurse's bell. Ricky, Nathan, and Steve were already at the end of Adler Road by the time Sean and Kurt got there. Ricky showed the others his Swiss Army knife. What's that for? asked Kurt. Be prepared, intoned Ricky. That's the scout's motto. Steve rolled his eyes. Great, we'll call you if we need a fish scaled. Let's get going. They started up the road. Soon they got to the trail that led up the foothills and to the old man's shack. With mounting excitement, they continued. The nurse ran into the room. Mr. Collins, she said, prying his fingers from the bell. What's the matter? He grabbed her wrist and tried to talk, but he felt that sharp, familiar feeling in his chest and began coughing. Only this time, he couldn't seem to stop. He held on to the nurse as his body shook and flecks of blood sprayed from his mouth. Mr. Collins, she said, frightened. Mr. Collins, l let me get the doctor. He shook his head and with huge effort, he forced himself to stop. No, he gasped. Wait, my hut, the cave. He blacked out for a moment and the nurse hit the intercom and asked for a doctor. The boys reached the field and marched bravely toward the far end. As they got closer to the shack, some of their courage leaked away and they moved slower. What if he's been released? asked Kurt. No way, said Sean. My sister said they'll have to monitor him for at least 24 hours. But what if there's someone else in there? whispered Steve. They stopped a few feet in front of the shack. Hello? called Ricky. Anybody home? They waited their nerves on edge, but all was silent. The one window of the shack was dark and empty. Come on, said Ricky suddenly. He strode forward before the others could react and pulled open the door. They all braced themselves for some kind of howling demon to rush out and devour Ricky, but nothing happened. The other boys edged closer. Hey, said Ricky, look at that. Kurt couldn't believe it. The back wall of the shack had a door in it. Yet the back wall was up against the hillside. You see, said Nathan proudly, I was right. He did find a gold mine. The rest of the hut was quickly examined and judged worthless. There was nothing in it but an old chest of drawers with some scraps of clothing, a small table, and a bed. A bowl with some shriveled fruit in it sat on the table. Ricky positioned himself in front of the back door. It had a bar across it that could be easily lifted off. He looked at the other boys. Are you ready, men? Old man Collins swung his mind out of the blackness. The nurse was there explaining to the doctor why she'd called him. The doctor leaned over him. Uh, Mr. Collins, he said gently, you're in pretty bad shape. Doesn't matter, he gasped. My hut. Your hut will be fine, the doctor tried to calm him. Now please, try to relax. Mr. Collins grabbed at the doctor's arm, but... His strength failed him. He began coughing again. This time, he felt something tear in his chest, and after a sharp pain, there was nothing. His vision grew dimmer, and his hand slipped from the doctor's arm. He was no longer in the hospital room. Instead, he floated over the field where his hut stood. Then, he was inside the hut, watching as the boys approached the back door. No! he yelled. Get away from there! but they couldn't hear him. Ready, men, he heard one of the boys say. The boy grabbed the bar across the back door. Stay away, the old man yelled again. I'm trying to protect you. Get out of there. It was no use. The boy slid the bar to the side and threw open the door. Behind the door was the dark mouth of a cave. As one, of the, boy, as, as one the boys pushed forward to peer inside. Then each of them felt an invisible force grab at them with terrible strength and pull them deeper inside the cave. No, screamed Mr. Collins with all his might. It was the last thing he ever said. What was he yelling about, doctor? The nurse asked as she looked down at the dead body of Mr. Collins. Delirium, answered the doctor. Who knows what they see just before they go. <laughs> oh man, okay.
That one, that one, I got, I don't know about you guys, that one hit the goosebump meter. That one hit the goosebump meter. What did you guys think of that one? That hit the goosebump meter for me, that's for sure. Oh, man. Oh, shoot. Oh, <laughs> Diane uh, commented, Adler Road sounds like a scary place. I don't know if you saw my smirk. Uh, I am uh, friends with several Adlers, and uh, I think uh, two of them are in the chat right now. Um, let's see. Um, <laughs> Joe Carr, he's growing weed. Well, that's not very family friendly, but very likely. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> John Oak Dalton, here for a spooky time, not a long time. Ain't it the truth? Um, let's see, I'm trying to keep up with you guys. Um, oh yeah, Michelle. Yay, my name is in, is a story about a hermit. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> medicinal, of course, that's a good uh, addition. Uh, let's see. That was intense, Ray Searcy. Yes, it was. Chris Gooley, lots of fun. I agree, that was a good one. Jeff McClellan said that was creepy. Rebecca Randolph, that was cool. Thank you guys. I, I, that was a fun one. And that is a heck of a way to start a book, scary stories for sleepovers. I, I could, I could, I could feel telling that to my friends as I terrorize them with my spoopy stories. Um, let me just get a little hot beverage. You know, the last few times I, I was drinking water, but this time I went for like an actual hot beverage. You can even see the steam a little bit because, uh, got to keep the voice going you know let's so you guys like that one i'm glad you did i did too um that one got creepy uh not a lot of the short stories i read uh jump back and forth in scenes uh kind of like a like a movie would and that was a, a really cool way to build suspense um i i read these stories cold I've, I do not read them in advance, so I get to be just as surprised as you guys. So when uh, when the old man started thinking, like, I, got, I wait, what about my shack? I was like, oh, no. Oh, no, there's something really bad. But then the best part for me was that they never tell us what it is, which means we all get to guess in our own psyches. And that, that's creepy. Uh, let's see. Oh, Shane Migliavaca just joined us. Hey, Shane, thank you for joining us. Shane's a phenomenal author, and uh, he uh, has done several scary stories for my podcast, Weekly Spooky, which you should check out if you get a chance at weeklyspooky.com. Every Wednesday, we publish a new story, a new short story. It's not family-friendly, so it's not exactly like this, but it is similar. Um, oh, thank you so much, John Dalton, for your very, very generous pledge, uh, or not pledge, uh, uh, tip. Man, I am a little out of it today. Uh, but thank you so much for the uh, for the tip. Tips are not required, but they are hugely appreciated. Thank you so much. It helps me keep it going, and it helps me buy lots of these books, which I think I've got. I think I've got seven of them coming in the mail. Um, so let's see. Uh, Chris Gooley, just because it's clear, don't make it water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, David Nor, it's probably fall break. Ooh, yeah. I hope those kids didn't cross fall break. Tony Giannot, any chance that you could make some of the stories into a movie? Um, I don't know. Uh, as far as like scary stories for sleepovers and stuff, I have no idea what the rights would be or anything like that. Um, but you never know. I mean, it wouldn't be terrible. Oh, Brittany Hahn said, hello. Hey, Brittany, haven't seen you in forever. I hope you're doing very, very well. I hope you're staying safe. If you're uh, stuck at home like I am, I hope you're keeping your sanity as best you can. Uh, of course, I say, you know, hope you're keeping your sanity as I'm reading uh, campfire stories on Facebook Live. But, you know, we all cope in our own way. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. So, but um, what I would, I would love, dude, I would love to do like a kid's horror movie or like a kid's spooky like anthology show or something. I would love to do it. I don't know if we could actually use stories from these books because I just don't know anything about, you know, the publishing rights. I mean, these were all released in the nineties and then quickly forgotten about, which is sad, but that's the way it is. I'm one of my favorite types of art is art that is kind of created to be forgotten. And I know that that may sound weird, but if you think about it, a lot of us like art that was created to be forgotten. If you've ever sat down and watched Little Shop of Horrors, the original black and white Roger Corman movie, that movie was shot in one weekend. The idea was to screen it as much as possible and then just throw the negative in the garbage. That was, that was their attitude then. 
That was before people thought that movies could have a further life. There was no home video. There was no cable uh, for it to air on. So that was the way a lot of those movies were treated. A lot of movies and TV shows are kind of made to be consumed right then and there, and then that's it. And the same thing goes for books. I, I love these books. I also collect young adult novels. I have Christopher Pike books, R.L. Stein books, Diane Ho books. Um, I love movies and stuff that are, like some people just consider pulp and trash, are kind of my lifeblood. They make me smile. Um, my, uh, I have original one sheets for movies most people have completely forgotten. Like, uh, I have a poster right here for Lou Diamond Phillips and Scott Glenn in Extreme Justice, which was an action movie released on home video and cable in 1993. No one remembered that. Uh, or Night of the Scarecrow, uh, Haunting of Morella. Those are just, these are just Evolver. Those are just movie posters I can see in this room that I'm in. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I have, my heart goes to things that are often forgotten. I don't know why, but that's just... That's just how I am. That's just how I do. All right. Uh, let's see what else you guys are saying in the chat. Ray Cersei, my son would love that. Heck, me too. I mean, I don't think... I, I thought when I read these, I would get a kick out of it for like 10 minutes and that would be it. But these kids' scary stories totally get me. I don't know why, but I, I they get into them. Brittany Hansen, I'm definitely trying. Uh, it's been like two years since you came into Holly's Home Cooking. Hope all is well with you. So far, so good. Um... All right, so before we start the next story, um, I do want to ask that uh, if you haven't already, or you know, if you feel like doing it again, please hit the share button. Um, it should be right around somewheresville here. Hit the share button and let people know uh, that you're watching right now and let people know that they are missing out if they don't join us. Um, we're gonna have a scary good time. I'm gonna be streaming until around about 10 p.m. Eastern, give or take. So uh, let me just get a little bit more hot beverage and then I think we can uh, jump into the next story. And this thermos keeps things boiling hot. Ah, oh, just what my throat needs though. All right, so let's see. The next scary story for sleepovers. <clears throat> Ooh, okay. It's got a solid title, that's for sure. All right. This next story is called <clears throat> Dead Giveaway. Terry woke up and looked at the clock. Oh no, he groaned. Time to get up already. Then he remembered. There was no school today. He lay back on his pillow and tried to figure out how he should feel about classes being canceled. There, was no cla there were no classes because Mrs. Stowe's funeral. She had been the fifth grade teacher, Terry... Fifth, she had been the fifth grade teacher, Terry's teacher. A couple of days ago, she had died in a car crash. Terry stared at the ceiling. His ex-teacher had always seemed to pick on him, and they had developed a mutual dislike for each other over the year. In fact, the day she died, the same day Midnight had run away, he had been so mad at her, he'd wished something would happen to her. She had embarrassed him in front of the whole class. When she found out he hadn't done that ho the homework assignment, she made him come up to the blackboard while she instructed him to write the assignment as if he were a second grader. When he had heard that, she, that something had happened to Mrs. Stowe, he felt guilty. He had never wished she would be killed, that's for sure. Suddenly, a black object leapt through the open window and landed on Terry's stomach. Hey, he yelled, midnight, you're back. The green-eyed cat looked up at Terry from her landing pad and began purring. <clears throat> she had found Terry nearly a week ago. He had been walking home from school when, out of nowhere, midnight had appeared. She ran right up to him and started rubbing against his leg. He examined her, and she looked pretty healthy, but there, were no identifying, uh, there was no identifying collar. He played with her for a bit, and when he came home, she followed him. He'd named her Midnight because her fur was the deepest, darkest black he had ever seen. Then... Just when the whole family was getting used to her, she ran away. Boy, Terry was glad to have her back. His mother came into the room. Well, look who's back, she said, walking toward midnight to pet her. But the cat completely ignored her and nuzzled Terry's side. Well, I guess she only has eyes for you. Then she added, don't forget, we're going to Mrs. Stowe's funeral today, Terry. Come on, Mom, how could I forget that? His mother smiled. You'd find a way. 
Most of the fifth grade, fifth grade class was at the funeral. Terry made sure to stand by Scott, his best friend. This is pretty weird, Scott whispered halfway through the ceremony. I mean, one day she's here making us do loads of homework and the next day, poof. Terry nodded. I know, he whispered back. It's not like she was my favorite teacher or anything, but geez. I heard she died instantly. An eyewitness said he saw a dark object run in front of the car. Who told you that? Terry demanded. Terry's mother hushed him before he got his answer, and he turned forward. The minister gave a long speech about Mrs. Stowe's dedication to her students. He was followed by Mr. Keller, the school principal. Terry tried not to fidget, but he really wanted to know more about what Scott had said. After the funeral, the kids piled back into their parents' cars. Terry talked his mom into letting him and Scott walk back to the house together. What did you mean when you said a dark object ran in front of Mrs. Stowe's car? Terry asked as soon as his mother was out of earshot. Ryan heard his dad talking about it. He said he, she swerved to miss it and ran right into a tree. Boom! It was possible, Terry thought. After all, Ryan's dad was a policeman. Do they have any idea what the dark object was? Ryan says they don't have a clue. It was really hauling. They reached Terry's house and spent the rest of the morning reading comic books. Scott had to go home at lunchtime to watch his little brother. Terry flipped on the television and sat on the couch. Soon, Midnight came into the room and curled up against his leg. He wondered about Mrs. Stowe and shivered. No matter how stupid she made him feel, he could never have wished death, to death on her. No, that kind of punishment had to be reserved for people who really deserved it, like Howard, the school bully. Terry grunted. All the kids hated Howard. He was the biggest kid in sixth grade, and he beat up everybody. Once he, had, once he had sent Terry home with a cut lip, and Terry had been too frightened to tell his parents what had really happened. He had told them he'd fallen on the playground. Yeah, he thought with a nod on his of his head. Howard was a person who deserved to be torn to shreds. The next day was school as usual, but when Terry got there, the playground was buzzing with excitement. Scott ran over to him to see. <clears throat> Scott ran over to him to, 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 as soon as he saw him. "You're not going to believe this, Terry!" Scott practically yelled. He had a wild look, and his voice sounded shaky. "Howard fell into the lion's den at the zoo and was torn to shreds." He. He's dead, Terry stammered. Yeah, they're saying something scared him and he fell in. Terry felt a chill creep over his skin as if some unseen hand were plucking at his arm hairs. Howard, he asked in a low voice. Are you serious? Scott nodded like his head would fall off. I know, I know, I didn't believe it either, but he didn't show up for class this morning, and then Mr. Keller came by and made the announcement that Howard had been found dead. Terry listened all day to everyone buzzing about Howard's death, and as the day wore on, he found himself beginning to panic. Could it be? He had trouble concentrating during class and was almost surprised when the bell rang at the end of the day. He caught a ride home with Scott and his mother, and when he got there, he practically ran inside. He slammed the door behind himself and dove onto the couch. Was it possible? No, no, it couldn't be. He buried his head in his hands and tried to convince himself he had nothing to do with Howard's or Mrs. Stowe's death. His mind was racing. He couldn't help thinking about a television movie he once saw, about a man who had trouble with his memory, and at the end of the movie, the man found out that during his blackouts, he'd been murdering people, is that what's happening to me? Terry wandered out loud. No, that's impossible. Mrs. Stowe died in a car crash, and as for Howard, sure he had just been thinking about it, that it was Howard's turn for some punishment, but there was no way that he could have had anything to do with that. Howard had an accident at the zoo. It had to be coincidence, Terry finally convinced himself. He felt a little better after that and went to his room to do some homework. The rest of the month passed uneventfully. Terry's mother left town to help out her sister, who was in the hospital. Terry slowly forgot his suspicions that he was a deranged killer who unconsciously murdered everybody he didn't like. Instead, he started to think about his friend Diane's birthday party at the end of the month. The entire fifth grade class was going, and it was shaping up to be the event of the semester. The Friday before the party, everyone was making plans to meet the next day. Terry got home and did all his homework so he wouldn't have to worry about it over the weekend. 
Then, because his dad still hadn't come home, he made himself a sandwich to snack on. Midnight came strolling in, and Terry chased her around the kitchen. Then she darted into the living room and began racing around with Terry in hot pursuit. Suddenly, she tore down the hall, and when Terry jumped after her, he crashed against the corner of his dad's display case. He yelled and stumbled to the floor. Then his blood chilled as he heard the sound of breaking glass. He slowly turned to look. The display case stood on four thin legs and had two glass doors. Inside was his father's collection of old camera equipment. Now the case lay toppled over, and Terry knew with a sick feeling that he would find what he would find when he stood up. Sure enough, the glass doors had broken when the ancient projector had fallen against them. What Terry didn't know was whether or not he had ruined the cameras in the projector as well. He cleaned up the mess as best he could and waited in agony until his father came home. His father noticed the damage the minute he walked in. What happened here? He asked in a disturbingly quiet voice. I'm sorry, Dad. I was chasing midnight and I tripped and fell against the case. It was an accident. His father didn't say anything right away, but walked over to inspect his collection. Then he turned to Terry. You know better than that. Terry hung his head. That was the worst part. He did know he wasn't supposed to run around the living room. Yes, he admitted. His father nodded. Yes, you do. He studied the shattered glass doors. Well, I'm going to have to go and get some glass cut tomorrow. Then I'll see if I can rehang those doors. And I think while I'm out, that would be the perfect time for you to sit quietly and think about why I make rules about what you should and should not be doing in the house. With dawning horror, Terry realized that his father was saying, You mean I'm grounded? He asked in panic. That's exactly what I mean. But Dad, you, you can't. Not tomorrow. Diane's party is tomorrow. Everybody will be there. Not everybody, because you'll be here. His father turned to look at him. No arguments. Terry opened and closed his mouth silently. He could feel hot tears get, beginning to burn his eyes. He knew it was useless to argue. He ran to his room and threw himself on the bed. It wasn't fair. He didn't mean to knock the stupid case down. His tears filled his eyes and ran down his cheeks. Why did his dad have to be so mean? Midnight came in and jumped on the bed next to him. Terry angrily shoved her away. Get out of here, you stupid cat. It's all your fault. He started to really cry then. Later, at dinner, he tried to persuade his father to change his mind. He offered to stay home Sunday instead, or all weekend next week. But his father wouldn't budge. Terry went to bed in a black mood and fell asleep planning to run away. That would teach his father not to be so hateful. In the middle of the night, he heard a loud thud. He opened his eyes and looked around the room, then switched on the light at the side of his bed. Midnight had pushed the door open slightly and was slinking into the room. Terry watched her curiously. Some trick of the light made Midnight seem bigger than usual. Then Terry remembered the thud. He also remembered he'd gone to bed very angry at his father. His father! Maybe that's where the thud came from. Maybe his father was in trouble. He ran out of his room and searched frantically through the house. But he couldn't find his father. Just as he was thinking the thud was in his imagination... Terry saw a dim light coming from the basement. He ran to the basement door and found it wide open. He stood at the top of the stairs and looked down, afraid of what he might see. There, crumpled in a heap at the base of the stairs, was his father. Dad! Terry screamed in anguish as he raced down the stairs to his father's lifeless body. Slowly, he wept over his father. Terry noticed something rubbing against his leg. Then he heard purring. Midnight, he shrieked. It's you! He tried to grab the dark animal, now almost twice its size, but she leaped out of his reach, purring wildly. What are you? Terry cried, tears streaming down his face. He grabbed a baseball bat from behind the door, then he swung it at the huge cat. Midnight jumped aside and Terry missed. He was panting with fear and almost blinded by tears, but he was still able to see the change coming over the cat. She was turning into a monster, prowling back and forth, her tail cutting through the air like a whip. And with each turn she took, her body swelled even larger. Terry threw the bat at the creature and practically flew up the basement stairs. He quickly slammed the door behind him just before the gigantic cat got through. For a moment he stood there, gasping for breath, trying to figure out what to do. Just as he was getting his mind to accept what was happening, a crashing blow shook the basement door in its frame. 
Terry jumped back and watched in terrified fascination as blow after blow hit the door. Then, with a noise like a saw blade cutting through wood, a huge black paw tore through the door. Terry backed slowly away, his mind no longer functioning. He watched the big black cat try to push its way through the hole. It now stood nearly as tall as Terry at its shoulders. Terry turned to run. There was a roar from behind him and the door splintered apart. He ran into the hall bathroom and slammed the door behind him. A second later, the monster hit it from the other side. Terry clawed frantically at the bathroom window while the cat battered at the door. Then, with a final thought that snapped his mind, he remembered that the window was barred on the outside. Numbly, he turned to face the bathroom door, just as the cat began to shoulder its way through. <laughs> oh man, I mean that just sounds like a normal cat to me, but okay. <laughs> That was, whoa, that was a fun one. Um, that was kind of cool. It was almost like monkey's paw for a second. But then it turned into just paw. <laughs> um, let's see what we got going on in the chat. Um, oh, shoot. Uh, thank you so much, Shane Migliavaca, for the very generous tip, my man. I really appreciate it. Hugely. Thank you so much. I know I say it a million times, but tips are not required, but they are hugely appreciated for us out of work filmmakers, just reading, um, uh, uh, just reading our, um, young adult horror fiction to people on Facebook. Um, oh, Tony Brown, you enjoying that hard to die poster, Henny? Great job on Ouija room, by the way. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, Tony, Tony Brown in the chat. I actually bought uh, a poster I've been looking for, for years off of him for a movie called hard to die. Another loved gem that would maybe be forgotten, but we won't let it and that hangs over my bed in my bedroom. All right, well, no, that one's in my office. My slumber part, my Sorority House Massacre 2 poster is over my bed. Ray Cersei, I have a really bad feeling Howard isn't going to make it. Wow, I'm magic. Solid. <laughs> Patrick Gunter, wait, you're not Joe Bob. Guilty. I'm guilty as charged. Uh, Terry has the death note. <laughs> Ray Cersei, oh lord, the cat killed daddy too. Midnight, no! Morgan Moore, you've heard of the Death Note. Now bring the Death Neko. <laughs> uh, that cat totally escaped from Joe as exotic. <laughs> that was from uh, Heather Fairchild. <laughs> Dang cat! <laughs> um, uh, Tony Giannot, I'm allergic to cats, lol. Well then you, sir, are safe. Or you're in more danger than any of us. <laughs> that was a fun one. Um, I, one of my favorite things about these books is I really never know where they're going. And, um, it must've been a fun challenge because, uh, these books were published like year by year by year by year. And even though they didn't all have the exact same, um, authors, I'm guessing that they, you know, would try pretty hard not to be too repetitive or to repeat themselves too often. So you end up with like last week, we had a great story about a pirate ship in the middle of the desert. That one was really fun. Oh, thank you so much, Ray Cersei, for uh, for your very uh, generous donation and also for your note, which says, poor Howard. Poor Howard. Darn it, Howard. Darn it, Howard. Oh, poor, poor Howard. So, um, all right. Let me get a little bit more to drink. Got to keep this throat, uh, you know, I got to keep it in fighting shape. So if you're, uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, we're going to be reading scary family friendly stories for, uh, about another hour, hour 15 or so until about 10 o'clock Eastern. Uh, we're going to chat, hang out. Uh, I do ask, uh, that you please, if you're watching and having a great time, you please, uh, click the share button. Even if you did an hour ago, share it again. Couldn't hurt anybody, right? It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, what is it? It's a safe legal high. Safe legal thrill. That's a better way to put it. But yeah, please hit share. Let people, uh, let people, uh, see what we're doing and how we're hanging out and having a good time together. And of course, tips are appreciated, but not required. So, uh, oh, my pal, Brad Benson tuning in for a minute. How you doing, man? All right. Well, my friends, uh, oh, Brad Benson just said, what's up, bud? Not much. Just 
reading scary stories and uh, keeping the sanity here, kind of. <laughs> um, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. All right. Um, uh, he says he's watching The Replacement Killers. I don't think I've seen that one. But I would watch it. I mean, I've watched a lot of stuff, especially uh, been watching a lot of series, you know, because, you know, we all have a little bit of time, or at least most of us do, unfortunately. Um, and thank you guys out there. If any of you are, you know, essential, I do appreciate it. Um, as silly as it sounds, you know, even if you're just a, you know, uh, uh oh, do we have a sound problem? Hello? Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm, my sound pack fell out of my pocket, so I had to fix it. Um, but, you know, even if you're just, uh, you know, making hamburgers and serving them to people, uh, you're providing a service that makes people feel a little bit better, you know, helps them feel like their lives are a little bit more normal than they actually are. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so let's go to another one and remember my friends hit that share button let's get as many people to come in and hang out in the chat and listen to a scary story and just kind of relax and have a social experience where we're all a safe distance from any coughs so uh okay david said we're good with sound thank you i appreciate the heads up all right <clears throat> let's see what's next Ooh, okay another story for you Mm. This one is called The Gift. Jason poked a pencil at the ants. The little black insects exploded into action, running around in tight circles and bumping into each other. Jason chuckled and scraped the pencil back and forth in the dirt, covering the hole the ant of the ant to the ant's nest. The workers scurried around crazily. Jason watched them for a while, then stepped away from his dresser and tossed the pencil back into his desk. He sat glumly on his bed, with his chin in both his hands. Then he heard rapping at his bedroom window, and turned around to look. Hey, said Eddie, Jason's neighbor, from outside the window. Want to come down for the uh, <laughs> want to come down to the fort with me and Mitch? I can't, said Jason with disgust. I've got to stay inside today. Feel that? Why? I got grounded. Eddie snorted. What for? Jason waved a hand at the ant farm. My cousin gave me that for my birthday, and I told him I thought it was a dumb gift, he sighed. Now my dad's making me stay inside as a lesson in politeness. Eddie laughed with the careless freedom of someone who's outside on a warm summer day. He jumped back from the window. All right, see you later. Jason watched him run down the street. His eyes were drawn back to the unwanted gift on top of his dresser. He still couldn't figure out why his cousin would give him something like that. He thought it was a pretty stupid gift. A flat plastic box filled with dirt and a bunch of black ants. If he wanted to watch ants, he could go out in the backyard. There were about a hundred other things he could think of that would make a better gift. He stared at the farm on the top of his dresser. I should just throw it away, he mumbled. But he knew his parents would get even angrier if he did that. They might ground him for the rest of the month. He stood up and shook the farm. The ants' tunnels collapsed as the small dirt shifted around. Stupid ants, Jason said, and left the room. He tried watching TV, but soon grew bored with that. He went out into the backyard for a while, but he grew tired of that, too. He could normally spend hours in the garden playing with his gang of superheroes, but not when he's forced to. He trudged back to his room to find something to do. His eyes narrowed as he spied the industrious ants rebuilding their tunnels and nests. He shook the plastic container again, sending the ants scurrying to dig out their trapped comrades. He decided to fix lunch. While he was searching for the mustard, an idea came to him. Grabbing a bottle of vinegar from the cupboard, he went back to his room and poured a few drops on the ants. The results were pretty disappointing. The ants didn't like it, of course, but all they really did was scutter away and perform some strange ritual that looked like looked as if they were trying to clean themselves. Jason tried a lot of other things next. He was going to suffer from being grounded all day, and the cause of his suffering was the ants, so they were going to pay. He tried salt, rubbing alcohol, and water, none of which did anything. Then he did something he knew was wrong. 
His parents would ground him for a year if they caught him. But he boiled some water and poured that on the ants. They died instantly. Then he grabbed some hydrogen peroxide from the bathroom. Although the, boi although the boiling water was most effective, the hydrogen, per per the hydrogen peroxide was the most impressive. Jason poured about a tablespoon of it into one corner of the farm. Within seconds of the liquid splashing onto them, the ants began to shake and dance as if they were being electrocuted. They lost all sense of direction and ran around in crazy patterns. Their legs seemed to be going in different directions at the same time. Then they kind of wound themselves into a circle, twitched a little while longer, and died. Jason thought it was great. He spent a couple of hours torturing the ants before he got bored. Then he went and found his dad in the garage. Dad? he asked quietly. His father looked over at him from the workbench. Jason tried to look at as humble as he could. I know it was mean of me to say that Brian was a, Brian's gift was dumb. I guess I was hoping for something else. Jason's father put one elbow on the workbench and studied Jason. Why the change of heart? Getting bored? Jason abandoned the humble approach. Can't I please go over to Eddie's house? He begged. I won't complain about anybody's gifts from now on. His father looked at his watch. Then he turned back to his project. All right, he said. Then he turned his head quickly and looked seriously at Jason. Don't do it again. He warned in a tone of voice that Jason knew from past experience was an ultimate order. Okay, he tore out of the garage and ran down the street to the fort. He spent the rest of the afternoon playing with his friends and forgot all about his aunts. Late in the day, he came back just in time to wash up and have dinner. After that, he took, uh, he took his shower. He didn't even look at the ant farm until that evening. The ants had been busy while he was out. They had re-dug their tunnels. Jason looked at the tunnels, but there was something strange about the way they were laid out. Even something familiar. Suddenly, he realized what was so familiar. An icy chill swept through his body, taking his breath with it. He took a step closer, unable to believe what he was seeing. The dead end tunnels and oddly shaped burrows formed letters. They spelled out a simple word. H A T E Hate. Jason's jaw began to ache and he realized his teeth were clamped tightly shut. He stared at the ants a moment longer, then ran to the bathroom. He grabbed the bottle of hydrogen peroxide from the shelf but his hands were shaking so badly he dropped it. Jason, he heard his mother call from the kitchen. What are you doing? Nothing, Mom, he managed to yell back. He snatched up the bottle and ran back to his room, biting his lip to keep from screaming. Breathing heavily, he stalked toward the ant farm. When, they, when he reached the front of his dresser, he unscrewed the cap off the bottle. Then, with great determination, he slowly poured the hydrogen peroxide over the whole farm. As the deathly liquids washed over the ants, they burst into convulsive frenzy. Their bodies jittered and danced across the soil as the peroxide burned its way into their systems. Jason watched, without pity, as the liquid seeped down into the tunnels. Then he shuddered and looked around the room as if he didn't recognize it. The ant farm was half filled with liquid and hundreds of ants were thrashing out their deaths. With a sob, he set the bottle down. Then, as cautiously as he would touch a snarling dog, he picked up the farm. <clears throat> he held it at arm's length as he snuck through the house and out to the trash cans in the backyard. Into the trash it went. Then, he ran back inside. As soon as he had calmed down and caught his breath, he went to the living room. Night, Mom, he said, kissing her on the cheek. Night, Dad. His parents wished him good night, and he returned to his room. Climbing into bed, lying back on his pillows, he tried to think about anything but the ant farm. But he couldn't. That wasn't real, he whispered to himself. He kept thinking that over and over until finally he fell into a troubled sleep. Late that night, he woke up suddenly. His skin felt funny. He reached over and turned on the small reading lamp on his nightstand. In the sudden light, 
he was puzzled to see that his arm was black from some kind of stain, and it felt as if it were on fire. Then, with a mental click that made him dizzy, he realized that his arm was covered with ants. His breath came in short gasps as he hurt as his head creaked around to look at his chest. A grotesque nightshirt of black ants covered his chest, each angry creature chewing at his flesh with its tiny jaws. Jason's thoughts spun out of control. He tried to scream, but a wave of ants swarmed into his mouth, blocking his voice forever. <laughs> Oh man, that one, that one, that one, I got into that one really hard. I got, and I, I even gave you the, uh, the Sandlot forever. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was a fun one. I, that's a classic of, of kids literature is, uh, punishing like really bad behavior, like cruelty to animals or cruelty to your siblings or, you know, what have you classic. Also real quick, I want to say thank you so much, uh, to Tony Giannot for your very generous tip. I really do appreciate it. Love you, man. Thank you for everything that you do. I hope we get to see each other this summer. Me too, man. Me too. I really do. Thank you so much. As you know, I say it a million times a show, but uh, tipping is not required. It's just appreciated. Um, so let's see what uh, let's see what you guys are saying in the chat. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Kevin DeFalco, does this have anything to do with VCR tapes? Not quite. Um, Mitch, is this a Baywatch tie-in? <laughs> uh, Michelle said, listen, ants are stupid, but you shouldn't be mean to them. <laughs> well, I mean, you sounds like you're just covering your bases because you know what could happen. Um, <laughs> Shane Migliavaca said, he's really asking for it. Oh, I mean, he was asking for it in just about five or six different languages fluently. Uh, Ray Searcy, what the heck, Jason? Right, Jason? Um, let's see. Morgan Moore uh, said, uh, this kid is so dead, somebody is already writing his epitaph. <laughs> right? Yeah, oh, yeah, he's so, so dead. Um, Ray Searcy said, gasp. <laughs> Shane said, ants in pants. He had ants in his pants, all right, and pretty much everywhere else. Uh, Dwayne West said, running late, but hello, my friend. I'm ready for my bedtime story. Well, you came to the right place because we have bedtime stories aplenty for you, my friend. So uh, I'm glad you guys liked that one. That one was fun. I uh, I particularly like the uh, ants swarming his mouth, silencing his voice forever. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm reading them, I just get like a perfect opening to, to go for, you know, something like that forever. Something warm to soothe the, uh, the vocal cords. So, uh, for those of you just joining us, we'll be going until about 10 o'clock Eastern, uh, reading scary stories that are really relatively family friendly. I mean, they're, you know, Adam's family, not Manson family, uh, but, um, so please hang out for a little while, chat with us in the chat room, have a good time, listen to a scary story or two. Um, oh, uh, Tony Janot said, why didn't he just eat them? Uh, I don't, I guess he didn't like get the idea of getting his protein from insects. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before I start the next story, I do want to say, um, remember hit the share button. I'm going to say it every time because uh, it does help a lot. It lets people know we're doing something fun and that they can be a part of it. And I think, I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think we can all agree that we would like to be a part of something fun with other people. Uh, <laughs> David Denoyer said, I thought you were going to read Gatsby in one sitting. Well, that's a very Andy Kaufman thing to do. But I have no reason to punish you guys by, uh, by reading The Great Gatsby from start to finish. Not that it's not a good book. All right. <clears throat> I apologize. My, my voice, um, thanks to the, uh, thanks to the, uh, weather. I have to fight with my voice a little bit, uh, more. Oh, Tony Janot said maybe he was a vegetarian. Ha ha. Oh, Emery Emery joined us. Uh, Hey Emery. Uh, thanks for popping in and listening to a, maybe listening to a scary story. I hope you and, um, your loved ones are doing well. I know that, uh, you just posted uh, that you were, uh, you, you were positive for COVID-19, but that you're not having any bad symptoms. I hope that's still the case. I hope you're feeling all right. Um, so let's jump in 
to the next story from our scary stories for sleepovers. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. This one is perfect for the setting. This one is perfect. I'm so excited. <laughs> I wish I had, uh, I wish I had some, um, marshmallows. All right. This story is called a camping trip. The bus pulled away with 14 yelling boys inside. Alex waved to his mom and dad from the rear window, then squeezed in between his two friends, Daryl and Kent. Can you believe it? Asked Daryl. Mr. Mr. Kane is actually t taking us hiking? Alex and Kent shook their heads in agreement as the three boys looked forward to the front of the bus at their science teacher. Mr. Kane had only just begun teaching at their school, and he was not very popular. He was going bald, and a fringe of reddish hair circled the base of his skull from ear to ear. His huge stomach always seemed to peek out between the buttons of his shirt. He wore thick black plastic glasses, and one of the boys had seen him smoking a pipe once. In class, he never laughed or made jokes. In fact, he never said anything that didn't have to do with science, and he kept to himself when he had, uh, <coughs> when he had lunchroom duty. The drive took the entire morning. Just after noon, they pulled into a small parking area deep in the forest. Mr. Kane led the boys off the bus. From here, we will follow the trail in for approximately one mile, he told them while they all ate their lunches. Then it branches, and we will follow the upper trail until we hit camp. When everybody was ready, the group set off. Late in the day, they came to a small lake. To one side was a grassy meadow filled with little white flowers. The rest of the lake was ringed with pine by pine trees. Mr. Kane led the class to the meadow, where they gratefully shrugged off their packs. Now, he announced, before any of you go off exploring, I want your tents set up. Then we'll gather firewood and I'll prepare the meal. Alex groaned along with the rest of the boys, but Mr. Kane insisted. As they unrolled the tents and sorted through the poles and ropes, they heard the soft clip-clop, clip-clop of hoofbeats. After a moment, a man rode out of the trees on horseback. He saw the class and headed over to them. He was younger than Mr. Kane and was tall and thin with a friendly smile. He wore jeans and a green flannel shirt with a forestry service patch on the sleeve. A cowboy hat was pushed back on his head. Hi, guys, he waved. Who are you? asked Mr. Kane, stepping forward. Park Ranger, you in charge here? Mr. Kane nodded. By this time, most of the boys were crowded around the visitor, petting his horse. Well, if you need anything, my station is up that trail over there, he pointed to the far side of the lake where a trail followed an inlet up the mountain. I've got a fire lookout up there. Hey, mister, said Billy. Is that some kind of gun? He was pointing to a black, futuristic-looking device that was sticking out of the horse's saddlebag. Well, sort of, the ranger laughed. He reached into the bag and pulled out the strange object. This is a crossbow. It's a bit different from a normal bow, as you can see. Crossbows came along about 400 years after the bow and arrow. Basically, you just put a bow on a stock like a rifle. He reached out into the saddlebag and drew out something that looked like an arrow, but was shorter and had a pointed tip instead of an arrowhead. Then you use a special kind of arrow called a bolt. It fits into the groove right here at the top of the stock. He placed the bolt on the top of the crossbow. Then you aim it like a gun and pull the trigger. How far can you shoot it? asked Daryl. Oh, a couple hundred yards, I suppose. Show us, the boys yelled. Can't do it, Ranger said, laughing. I don't like to waste my bolts on trees and rocks. You never know when you'll run out and do, when you'll run into a dangerous animal. He put the crossbow away and grabbed the reins. Take care, guys. Have a good time. The boys waved goodbye, disappointed. But they had plenty to talk about after the Ranger's visit. After a dinner of hot dogs and beans, Mr. Kane made them wash their dishes. It was getting dark fast. Too late to do any exploring, but Mr. Kane was building a fire and roasting marshmallows and telling spooky stories surrounded, uh, sounded just as fun. They sat around the fire, still talking excitedly about the ranger and his crossbow. Then, to everyone's surprise, <clears throat> Mr. Kane spoke up. Are any of you familiar with the story of the Lotham boys? They all shook their heads. Jeremy, Donald, and James were the three brothers, he began, one day, Jeremy was hiking around and saw something sticking up out of the ground. It looked like it might be the shriveled side of a dead tree trunk. Jeremy dug around it to see for sure. He kept digging and digging, but suddenly he shrunk back in horror. It was a head! 
an old mummified Indian head. It was then that he realized he was on an ancient Indian burial ground. You know, the Indians used to roam these very mountains, long before the white man came. Alex had a brief moment of surprise as he realized that Mr. Kane was a really good storyteller. All of the boys were quiet, listening intently as the first mummy was dug up and brought and brought to the brother's secret fort, then as it came to life and killed Jeremy. The younger brothers, James and Donald, tried to escape, Mr. Kane continued, but the mummy grabbed Donald and lifted him off the floor. Donald kicked and squirmed, but he couldn't break loose. As James watched in horror, the mummy plunged its hand into Donald's chest and tore his heart out. James dove through the doorway and ran down that mountain like he had never run before. And he made it. But he never found out what happened to the monster. And he never, ever came back into these mountains again. At the end of the story, Alex shivered. Mr. Kane told an excellent story. All of the boys seemed equally surprised. Mr. Kane looked around and smiled. All right, men, he said standing. Time for bed. He watched while everyone got ready. And don't, wander, and don't wander off in the middle of the night, he warned as they crawled into their tents. The next morning was sunny and warm. By the time Alex got dressed, some of the other boys were up. Mr. Kane had already started a fire and was serving breakfast. Martin, he said, could you please wake up Brett? Tell him he's going to miss breakfast if he doesn't hurry up. Martin walked over and pulled back the tent flap. Mr. Kane, he's not here, he cried, turning to the others. Mr. Kane stood up and walked over, surrounded by the rest of the boys. Brett's sleeping bag was open, but there was no sign of the body of the boy. Mr. Kane looked around the clearing, then he called out, Brett? Brett? Within moments, all the other boys were shouting Brett's name too, but there was no answer. Mr. Kane turned to face the boys. All right, clean up your distant dishes, then form into pairs. With excited speed, they did as, as he said. One boy, Kent, was left alone. Kent, said Mr. Kane calmly, you stay with me. The rest of you split up and search around the lake for Brett. If you find him and he's hurt, one of you stay with him and the other come back here to get me. Understood? The boys, the boys nodded. Whoops. Lost my thought for a second. Please do not go too far, he cautioned, and pay attention to the direction you're going so you can find your way back to camp. Alex and Daryl decided to go search the far side of the lake. They searched for over an hour with no luck. When it was nearly 10 o'clock, they thought it was best to get back to the campsite. Mr. Kane was there with the rest of the other boys. None of them had found any trace of Brett either. Hey, Mr. Kane, asked Daryl. Where's Kent? Mr. Kane looked at him strangely. He went to find you and Alex. Isn't he with you? Daryl and Alex shook their heads. Alex felt very cold all of a sudden. The rest of the boys were quiet. Then John slowly raised his hand. Mr. Kane, he asked quietly, you don't suppose something's happened to them, do you? That was exactly what Alex was thinking, but he joined the other boys in teasing John. What do you think? A monster ate them? He laughed nervously. Mr. Kane held up his hand. Quiet down, boys. He turned to John. That is a very good question, but I'm not sure. So I want all of you to stay here while I hike to the ranger station and radio for help. He looked around at the at each of the boys. Stay together. You understand? I should be back within two hours. They all nodded quietly. Mr. Kane picked up a small pack and started walking. As soon as he was out of sight, the class exploded into excited questions. I don't care what you guys think, John said loudly. This is weird. Oh, come on, said Doug. Brett probably fell down the mountain. Well, what about Kent? asked Daryl. Who knows? answered Billy. Maybe he went to see the ranger and maybe he got lost. Lost? Alex yelled. How do you get lost walking around a lake? What happened to then? What happened then? Billy yelled back. At that, all the boys started yelling back and forth. Then Martin's voice cut through them all. What about Mr. Kane? he asked. Alex felt a small shiver twitch through his body. He wished Martin hadn't said that. The rest of the boys stared at Martin. Why not? He continued. Did you see the way he looked when I told him Brett's tent was empty? He wasn't even surprised. He looked around him. Maybe he's not even going to the ranger station. Maybe he's out there right now watching us. 
No way, Alex shouted. That's crazy. Mr. Kane is a teacher. Yeah, asked Doug. For how long? He's only been at Golden Oak for one semester. He could be anyone. Yeah, agreed Daryl, turning to Alex. Remember, Kent didn't think he was the kind of person who'd want to go camping unless, he said slowly, looking at all of them, unless he's not really here to camp. Alex shook his head violently. His friends were building a strong case, but he still couldn't believe it. Then why would he wait until now to kill one of us, Doug asked. Alex was relieved someone was coming to Mr. Kane's defense. And why do it this way, Doug continued. What are people going to do when we get back and two kids are missing? There'll be cops all over the place. Who says any of us will get back? Asked John quietly. Maybe none of us will. And Mr. Kane will just drive on to the next school. Alex didn't know whether to laugh, scream, or cry. He was breathing heavily, and cold sweat was running down his sides. He looked around. Then what, what do we do, he asked. Nobody answered, and he continued. Do we hike out? What if it's not Mr. Kane? Then what happens? What if Mr. Kane gets back here with the ranger, and we're all gone? What if Kent shows up and finds everybody's gone? What, what then? But what if it is Mr. Kane, added Alan. Then what? Do we just sit here and wait for him to pick us off? Once again, the air was split by twelve shouting voices. Daryl pulled Alex aside. Alex, what do you really think is going on? I don't know. Mr. Kane did bring us here. Alex looked at their friends. Everyone looked scared. Martin looked like he was ready to cry, and Alex felt like he wanted to also. He turned back to Daryl. In a very low voice, he said, Do you think we should go to the ranger station ourselves? Daryl stared at him. Are you crazy? He finally asked. I don't know what else to do. I think if the two of us go, it'll be okay. Daryl thought about it, then took a deep breath. All right, he decided. Let's do it. They told the others that they planned to hike to the ranger station for help. There was a shocked silence, but nobody else offered to come. Do either of you guys know how to get there? Asked Doug, finally. Well, the ranger said it was just up the trail at the end of the lake, answered Alex. I guess we'll just follow it until we get to the station. Alex and Daryl set off. They made their way around the lake. Then, with Daryl in the lead, they started climbing. The trees grew thick and tall along the trail, and the afternoon sun barely filtered its way through the needles of the pines. They walked in silence. Alex barely watched the trail. He spent most of the time turning his head this way and that, trying to look in a hundred directions at one time. How much farther could it be, he asked for a while. I don't know, panted Daryl. Maybe he meant it wasn't far on horseback. Alex looked at the sky. Let's just hope we find it before it gets dark. What if we don't, Daryl asked. What if we're nowhere near it and Mr. Kane has been following us all along? Shut up, hissed Alex. I think... Alex never told Daryl what he thought, because just then they heard a noise. They froze and listened as hard as they could. It came again. Someone or something was walking down the trail. The two boys stood still for a moment, paralyzed with fear. Then, at almost the same time, they dove off to the side of the trail and hid among the trees. The footsteps grew louder. Alex looked from his hiding place over at Daryl, whose eyes bulged in terror. The tears were running down his face. Then, a shape appeared out of the gloom. It took a moment for Alex to realize it, but then he felt a relief so intense he thought he'd fall down. It was the ranger. The boys burst back onto the trail from their hiding places. The ranger stopped, surprised on his face. He held the crossbow in one hand and wore a backpack on him, and wore a backpack. Mr. Ranger, Alex practically screamed. Boy, am I glad to see... His voice trailed off as his throat tightened in fear. The ranger started to smile. Hey, said Daryl from the behind him. That looks like Mr. Kane's pack. The entire forest seemed to hold its breath as Alex watched a small drop of blood fall silently from the loaded crossbow to the ground. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Oh, man. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I just got a little bit of goosebumpies. I'm fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> what would you guys think of that one? 
see what you guys have to say. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, scary. <laughs> Shane Migliavaca said, scary stories for quarantine. That's such a great name. I should have went with that. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Heather Fairchild said, uh, and this is how Daryl Dixon got his start. <laughs> uh, Shane Migliavaca, Indian burial ground. This never ends well. Fair. Uh, David Denoyer, nonsense. We all want to be buried in a pet cemetery. <laughs> Mark Shields said, sometimes dead is better. So everybody's going all about uh, a pet cemetery references right now. Uh, Tony Giannot, never trust a ranger. Uh, fair. Ranger danger. Uh, Jeff McClellan said, I loved it. Thank you. Rebecca Randolph said, that was good and creepy. Thank you. And Diane said, it's always the ranger. Right? I, you just can't, you just can't trust a ranger. And then Shane McLeod said, ranger danger, great minds. Um, the barrier is not meant to be crossed, the, crossed, the barrier is not meant to be crossed. The ground is sour. That's what Dwayne West said. We're going all pet cemetery on this one. That one was really fun. <laughs> Mark Shields, brutal. That was, these are, I mean, the last book, uh, that I read of scary stories for sleepovers. I think it was even more scary stories for sleepovers. It had a lot, uh, almost entirely um, uh, bad endings for the main characters, which I think makes sense if you think about like what is scary to tell at a sleepover. Like nobody is scared by the story where the kids, you know, see the haunted ghost with the axe and then they run away and they realize they'll never, uh, you know, s you know, feed their broccoli to the dogs again. It, it's just not exciting. But when it's, you know, that these, the kid got selfish and went to the woods hoping to find a, a locket or something, and then he realizes he's going to turn into a tree, that's scary. Um, and that's actually one of the stories I read. But this one has definitely got a little bit more of a, uh, of a uh, macabre tone to it than some of the other ones have. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so... Uh, I want to say again, I know I say it all the time, but please hit the share button, share this with everybody. We've got, you know, another 40 minutes or so that we're going to be hanging out, reading scary stories and stuff like that. And honestly, I mean, it's not a hard cutoff at 10 o'clock. It's just that my voice starts to give out after about two hours of reading. So I try to take care of it. Luckily tomorrow, all I have to do is mow the lawn. Literally all I have to do is mow the lawn. <laughs> So I appreciate you guys joining me for scary stories for quarantine. Um, oh, uh, let's see. Um, Dwayne West said, Yogi and Boo Boo, ma uh, Mad Ranger Mad for taking the picnic basket. <laughs> and Tony Giannot said, that tree story still creeps me out. I think that was the first story we read on the first live stream, which they're all, you can find them on YouTube if you search Uncle Henny's, uh, uh, you know, uh, campfire stories. Or you can uh, you can check it on Facebook. They're they're all archived. Highly recommend you, you sit and listen to one. They, there are some gems in here, some serious gems. All right, let's see. Oh, looking good. It's about nine twenty. Well, my friends, I guess we'll go to another one. But again, hit that hit the share button, guys. Let's get some people hanging out with us. We've been hanging at around around thirty people. That's pretty good, but we can do better than that. We need, the more people around the campfire, the better. And it's definitely a campfire and not some kind of programmable LED light that simulates a fire. Um, so, all right. <clears throat> well, I'm excited because I, I peaked the title of the next story and it made me excited. So I'm gonna start that one up in just one second once I spray a little throat, throat spray. Let's see. <laughs> what is next? Okay. Are you ready? <clears throat> I'm ready. This story is called Mummy's Little Helper. Anna lay in bed with the sheets pulled up under her chin. Her ears felt like they were stuck straight out from her head. She was always lis she was listening so hard. Her eyes stared into the darkness of her bedroom. Then she heard it again. A high, whispery voice that seemed to come from the walls around her. Help me. The voice breathed. Help me. 
Annie whimpered and pulled the cover over her head. After a moment's thought, she stuck her head back out again to watch the room. Then, just like the night before, she heard soft sobbing flow around her like air. Except, last night she had run into her parents' room and spent the night huddled between the two of them in their bed. That was when she found out that, for some reason, they were unable to hear the voice. Tonight, she asked quietly, Who are you? The sobbing stopped. Annie's breathing stopped, too. She waited for an answer. Help me, the voice beat begged again. Where are you? Annie asked, slightly louder. There was no reply. She waited for an answer, but none came. Still scared, but also a little disappointed, she soon fell asleep. The next day at school, she pulled her friend Robin aside on the playground. My bedroom is haunted, she announced abruptly. Robin stared at her. What do you mean? Annie looked, around, looked over her shoulder to make sure there was no one around. The last two nights, she whispered, I've heard a voice coming from my walls. Robin's mouth dropped open. What? She looked at Annie as if she were speaking a different language. I know it sounds really weird, but I swear the voice is really soft, but kind of whiny like a little kid's. What does it say? It just keeps asking me to help it. What? Annie threw her hands up. I know! It keeps saying, help me! She mimicked in a whispery voice. And it knows my name. I'm really starting to get scared. Have you told your parents? Annie shook her head. No, I mean, I tried, but they can't hear it. Maybe only kids can hear it. Besides, I'm not even sure it's real. She looked at her friend in desperation, hoping Robin would tell her she wasn't going crazy. Robin just shook her head and looked puzzled. Annie continued, I want you to help me figure out what's going on. M me? Robin took a step back. H how? I already asked my mom if you could spend the night tonight. If you stay, then we'll see if you can hear it too. Robin looked around her as if she were trying to get away. I, I don't know, Annie. Please, you're, you're my best friend. Robin thought about it for a moment. All right, she agreed uneasily, but I hope we don't hear anything. That night, the two girls huddled under the covers of Annie's bed together. What do you think it is? Robin asked. Annie thought for a moment. I think it's the ghost of some poor kid who died here. Maybe the house was built over some old Indian graveyard, like in Poltergeist, Robin suggested. Do you think it could be the house itself talking? Annie wondered. Their excited whispers soon became yawns as the night wore on. Annie had tried to keep Robin from falling asleep, but with no luck. She stared sleepily at the ceiling. I don't know if I want to hear the voice again or not, she thought. But what if the ghost of some poor little girl, just like me, maybe... Annie, the voice called. Help me. Annie's eyes snapped open, and she pushed at Robin's uh, shoulder. Her friend turned over and started to speak. Annie quickly put one hand over Robin's mouth, and with the other held a finger to her lips. Help me, the voice pleaded. Robin's eyes grew so wide, Annie thought they'd pop out of her head. She sat up and pulled Annie's hand away. Where's it coming from, she whispered. She was so scared her voice was almost as high as the ghostly one. Annie shook her head violently. She put her mouth next to Robin's ear. I don't know. They both strained their ears. Help me, the voice cried, beginning to sob. Come on, Annie whispered. Let's see if we can hear it uh, anywhere else in the house. Are you crazy, Robin hissed. Come on, Annie urged. She slipped out of bed and practically pulled Robin out too. Annie, I don't think this is a good idea. Annie waved her to be silent. This was beginning to be the most, in uh, this was beginning to be, this was beginning to be more interesting than scary. Maybe they would solve some ancient mystery. They crept into the hallway. The sobbing seemed louder there. Can't your parents hear this? Asked Robin. Uh-uh, said Annie, pulling her friend down the hall after her. As they approached the kitchen, the sobbing seemed to grow louder. It no longer seemed to come from the walls, but now carried up from the floor beneath them. Suddenly, Annie whirled and faced Robin. 
I know where it's coming from. Where? The basement. Robin stared at the floor. Should we tell your mom and dad? Annie thought about it. It was one thing to have an adventure, but it was another to get in trouble for doing it. And they would if they woke her parents up. It would be more exciting to solve the mystery on their own, though. Let's just go take a look, she finally decided. If it's something bad, we'll get mom and dad. Robin studied her friend. All right, she agreed after a moment. Then she shook her head. I can't believe we're doing this. They crept through the kitchen to the utility room. Annie grabbed a flashlight from one of the drawers and led Robin over to the basement door. With a deep breath, she pulled the door open and shone the light in. The sobs seemed to fill the room. They were definitely louder here than anywhere else in the house. Annie turned on the basement light. With the glare of the bare light bulb, the sobbing stopped. Annie and Robin stood on the top steps and examined the room. There was nothing there that was out of the ordinary. A long table stood against one wall where Annie's father kept all his tools. Off in one corner was the water heater, and next to that was a cedar closet where, the, where her mom kept some old clothes. The furnace took up the other corner. Annie descended a few more steps and looked around. She glanced up at Robin. Then she walked all the way down into the basement. The floor was made of long wooden planks laid over the bare earth. There's nothing here, she announced, somewhat surprised. Are you sure? asked Robin from the stairs. Annie nodded. Yeah, come on down. Robin stepped cautiously down to the basement floor. It sure sounded like it was coming from down here. Annie turned to answer. Yeah, it really... Help me, the voice broke in. She had been right. There was someone down here. Annie's blood was racing. She barely noticed that Robin was about to scream. Help me, Annie, the child voice begged. The voice had come from under the floorboards. But how could something live under there? Was there a cave or something? Annie. <clears throat> Annie, he warned Robin in a cracking voice. Don't. Annie frowned at her friend. Look, she said, pointing to the wooden planks. I'll bet you someone's buried under there. And now they need help. They need to have a decent burial. Robin felt like she was going to throw up. Annie, she pleaded with her friend. Let's get your parents or the police or, or someone. She started to back away towards the stairs. Annie was too excited to stop. She felt like a detective solving an important case. She strode over to her father's tools and grabbed a chisel and hammer. She looked up at Robin. You don't have to stay if you're afraid, but close the door behind you. I don't want to wake my parents. Robin climbed the stairs and closed the door. She sat down on the steps, too worried to leave her friend alone. Annie attacked the floorboards in front of the stairway. She managed to get the chisel under the edge of one of the planks and using the hammer was able to pry it up. A dark space was revealed. She sat back and studied the hole. Did she really want to do this? Then she grabbed the flashlight and beamed it into the opening. Under the floorboards was a small, shallow grave scooped out of the dirt. And huddled in the bottom was the mummified body of a small child. I was right, Annie said triumphantly, looking up at Robin. Robin peered down at Annie. She heard a dry sound, like two pieces of paper being rubbed together. Then she gasped. A brown, flaking arm had shot out of the hole. Robin's stomach seemed to jump to the back of her mouth as she watched the thing drag her kicking friend into the hole with incredible strength. A horrible thought thrust into her mind like an icicle. That when something calls for help, it might be because it's hungry. Then her mind stopped working. And she sat on the steps and screamed. <laughs> okay, that one got me. I got I, That one got me the goosebumps going. <laughs> I don't care if I'm a nerd or a loser. I love crap like that. That was a good time. Uh, let's see. How is everybody doing? Waiting for it to load. There we go. <clears throat> Heather Fairchild. Nope. This is precisely the moment when I check out. Why do people always stick around in a haunted house? <laughs> Morgan Moore. I see this story comes with its own pop culture references. <laughs> Shane Migliavaca. Haunted house. Or maybe just gas. <laughs> um, and Heather Fairchild, Fairchild said, no, she doesn't. Told you so. Yeah. I think we can all agree 
that it was probably not the wisest move uh, to, um, yeah. Probably not the wisest move to go down there. But I love the part where she says, if you're not going to help, close the door behind you. I don't want to wake my parents. That is a certified uh, BA right there. She is tough AF. Uh, Shane Migliavaca, that's why I always bury them six feet to seven feet down in my basement. Oh, wait. Yeah, you might not. Yeah. <laughs> There's no statute of limitations on bodies in your basement, homie. <laughs> Oh, so let's see. Tony Giannotti. I liked it. I liked that one too. That one did. He got the chills. I love when the endings are kind of revealed and you have to kind of sit with the, the, the horror of it all. So whew, my, my voice is getting a little raw, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, all right. I think we're going to do one more, my friends. And then I'm going to call it a night because we're about halfway, if not halfway through Scary Stories for Sleepovers. And I want to save the other half for this time next week when I'll be here hanging out with you reading. And uh, I just want you to know there will be no shortage of Scary Story books. I have ordered five, I believe, or six. So there will be no shortage of Scary Story books. So don't you all worry. Uh, okay. Okay. I think I, can, I think I got it going. I think I got the voice. And again, uh, thank you to all the folks who've, uh, who've tipped me. I really do appreciate it. It's not required, but it is appreciated because like a lot of people, I'm not special. I'm out of work. And uh, this is a fun way to hang out with everybody, have a little bit of fun. And you guys have really been incredibly kind and generous and made it uh, something that has helped me buy some groceries and dog food and more books. So thank you guys. All right. We're going to go to our last story and then I'll hang out for a little while and, uh, and then we'll all go about our evenings with, uh, hopefully not too many scary dreams. Um, <laughs> David Denoyer asked, when do we get a live reading of as bad as I want to be? That's the, <laughs> that's the, uh, Dennis Rodman autobiography. Um, you know that we'd have to raise a lot of money for me to sit and read the entire as bad as I want to be a lot of money. To be honest, I'll, uh, we'd have to be maggoty with cash for me to, to be willing to do that. All right, friends, our final story of the night. And feel free to hit the share button. Why not? Thank you, guys. Seriously. All right. <clears throat> this story is called Shadow Play. Uh-oh. David stood in the middle of his new room looking at all the cardboard boxes. He kicked at one. He still hadn't gotten used to the move. In fact, he wished his dad had never gotten the new job. Don't just stand there, David, said his mother from the doorway. Start putting your stuff away. David opened the nearest box and pulled out some clothes. He knew his parents were excited about the new house, so he tried not to be too mad. But it just wasn't fair. He would never see any of his friends again, and who knew what the kids in the new school would be like. He finished unpacking and decided to go out front. <clears throat> that was one nice thing about the new house. It had a front yard to play in. It was a pretty good sized lawn with a hedge along the sides and some brushes, bushes and ivy grew along the front of the house. There were probably some good spiders to be found in this yard, he thought as he poked through the ivy. What you doing, came a voice from behind him. David sat up and turned to see another boy on the sidewalk. He had stopped his bicycle and was watching David. Just goofing around, David answered. My name's Greg. I, I live over there, he pointed down the street. What's your name? David. This your house? Uh-huh, we, we just moved in. Too bad, pronounced Greg, shaking his head. David looked at him in shock. What do you mean? Now it was Greg who looked shocked. Didn't your parents tell you? David shook his head. Greg laid his bike down and came over to crouch by David. The family who lived here before yours, he now whispered, disappeared without a trace. What? David said with disbelief. He watched Greg closely, certain he'd start laughing any second. But Greg just shrugged. Nobody knows. It was a mom, a dad, and their son. They lived here about ten years. Weird family. Really mean. 
but where did they go? Greg shrugged again. You see, one night there was a really big storm. I, I remember because I thought our roof was going to blow off. There was lightning and thunder and it was raining buckets. All the lights went out. Yeah, said David. So? He was getting impatient. So the next morning, the storm was gone, but the front door of this house was wide open. My dad and some other grown-ups checked it out, and there was nobody home. David sat back, relieved. Big deal, they probably left on vacation and forgot to close the door. Greg stood up angrily. Yeah, well, they never came back, and their car was still here. Just then, they both heard Greg's mother calling to him. I gotta go, he stood up and mounted his bike. Good luck. He wished David before pedaling away. That night at dinner, David asked his parents if they knew what had happened to the people who lived there before them. No, said his father. What have you heard? Some kid from down the street told me the family left one night and never came back. David saw his father and mom, his dad and mom look at each other and quickly look away. Well, David, his father said, the lady who sold us the house said they moved away. What if they come back and want their house. They won't, his father smiled. The house is ours now. Later that night after going to bed, David heard his mom and dad arguing in the living room. He slipped quietly out of bed and crept into the hallway. You're not worried, he heard his mother say. I'm sure it'll never go any further, his dad answered. But who knows what those kids will be telling David. Honey, his father answered, I sincerely doubt those kids' fathers went home and told them there was blood sprayed all over the place. Shh, David might hear. All right, his father said in a lower voice. Look, I really don't think there's anything to worry about, okay? I'm sure David has heard all he'll ever hear, he ever will about the house. I hope you're right. They fell silent, and after a moment, the television came on. Dad snuck back to his room and laid in bed. David snuck back into his room and lay in bed. His mind was racing. Blood? Whoa. A mystery? This house might turn out to be pretty cool after all. What had happened here? He started to he stared at a dark corner of his room and thought of old horror movies he'd watched. But what was that? David thought he saw something move in the darkness. His breathing stopped as he tried to convince himself that he hadn't seen anything. He had thought that the cor the corner was empty. Hadn't it been when he climbed into bed? He sat up slowly, staring at the corner. He could hear the television in the other room. Then he saw it again. In the darkest corner of his room, something moved. But there wasn't anything there, was there? No, it was more like the darkness itself had moved. He sucked in his breath and glanced at his nightstand. A small bedside lamp stood there next to the clock. With a moan, David shot his hand out and switched on the small lamp. The yellow light filled the room, and in the corner was nothing. His heart pounding, David looked around. There was nothing out of place, nothing that shouldn't have been there. Had he really seen something? He studied every inch of his room to make sure there was nothing there. Then he slowly settled back down into bed and stared at the corner until his eyelids grew heavy and fell over his eyes. The next morning, his father came in to wake him. As David rubbed the sleep out of his eyes, his father switched off the bedside lamp. Did you forget to turn the light off? He asked David. Uh, yeah, David answered. Sorry, Dad. All that day, he tried to forget what had happened the night before. It was ridiculous, he told himself. He was really being a baby. He hadn't been afraid of the dark since he was a little kid. No, he, he must have been half asleep and imagining things. That night, however... After his parents tucked him in, he wasn't so sure anymore. Gathering his courage, he turned off his bedside lamp and sat back on his pillow. There was enough light coming from the living room to fill his room with a pale shadow. His eyes darted from side to side, watching. Then his room seemed to grow suddenly colder. In the inky blackness under his desk, there was movement. David's eyes locked onto the spot. His breath came faster. There was nothing there. There couldn't be. Then it moved again. It was shapeless, like a blob. And it didn't move like an animal. It flowed like water, out from under the desk and straight for the foot of his bed. David screamed and shot his hand out to switch on the light. 
The electric glare drove the shadow back, where it pooled on the floor under his desk. "'What's the matter, honey?' asked his mother as she ran into the room. His father was right beside her. "'I, I, I thought I saw something move over there,' David's voice broke. "'Under the desk!' David's father flipped on the room light, banishing the shadows. He knelt down and looked under the desk. "'There's nothing here,' he announced. "'The shadow,' David insisted. "'The shadow was moving!' His mother sat on the edge of the bed in suit and smoothed his hair. You were having a bad dream, dear. David opened his mouth to argue, then realized it was useless. His parents would never believe him, and in the bright light of the ceiling lamp, he wasn't sure he believed it either. It sure had seemed real, though. Yeah, he said. I guess so. Sorry. His mother smiled and got up. That's okay. His father stood up, too. Night, kiddo he said, turning to leave. As he walked out, he flipped off the room light. David watched the shadows reappear. Dad, can I leave the room light on? Please? His father looked annoyed, but turned the light back on, and the shadows fled. Sweet dreams, honey, his mother wished him. Then his parents left the room. For the next few nights, he slept with his room light on. He knew his father was less than pleased about it, one day he heard them in the kitchen talking about his fear of the dark. They were both worried about him and his father thought it was nonsense. David walked slowly back to his room and sat on the bed. Maybe his dad was right. He was too old to be afraid of the dark, but it seemed too real to be a nightmare. That night he resolved to do something about it. When his parents came in to tuck him, uh, came to tuck him in, he said, "I'd like to try sleeping with the lights off." Are you sure? His mother asked. He nodded. All right, she said. She said. His father stood over him and ruffled his hair. Good night, he said. It'll be okay. They left the room, and David closed his eyes. David woke suddenly from a deep sleep. He didn't know what had awoken him. Then he remembered. His light was off. A shiver danced over his skin like cold water being poured on him. He slowly sat up in bed. He looked toward the corner of his room. In the faint light cast by the street lamp outside, he could see an enormous shadow stretched halfway up the wall. It had no definite shape, but flickered and shifted like black fire. A small voice in the back of David's mind tried to tell him it was just the shadow of a tree or something. But then, as if the shadow knew he had seen it, it rushed towards him. He screamed and threw himself toward... And threw himself toward his bedside lamp. His numb fingers fumbled with the switch as he kicked himself out of his bed sheets. Just as the shadow was reaching his bed, the light flared on. His parents came running into the room. Well, what is it? His mother asked. His father stood in the doorway with a strange expression on his face. David babbled out the story through his tears. The shadow, it, it almost got me. His mother held him and tried to calm him down. It's all right now. We're here. Don't worry. David wondered if he was going crazy. He knew his parents probably thought so, which made him feel worse. He finally calmed down, but only after talking his parents into leaving the light on before he went back to bed. The next day dawned gray and drizzly and grew quickly worse. Thick black clouds rolled in the, to cover the sun. The wind began to blow hard, and David watched his father lock all the patio furniture in the garage. Then, with a flash of lightning and a crash of thunder, the rain began. Huge drops shot down from the sky and shattered against the ground. The windows rattled with every gust of wind, and it looked as if somebody were washing them down with a hose. The sound of the rain pelting against the pavement outside was loud enough to be heard inside the house. Since four o'clock, the sky had been pitch black. David was huddled on the couch with his mom watching television. His dad sat in his chair reading. David was glad to be inside on a night like this. A blast of lightning lit the sky, and the thunder that followed seemed to shake the house, the entire house. David crawled further under the blanket with his mom. Gusts of wind pushed at the house. Suddenly, the room went dark. David heard his father mutter something. Then he said louder, Electricity's out! To David, those two words seemed to stop his heart. No electricity? That meant no lights! He hugged his mother tightly and whispered, what are we going to do? It's all right, David, she said. We've got candles and a flashlight. David heard his father get up. Where are the candles? He asked. In the third drawer in the kitchen, his mother answered. His dad went to find them while his mother held David. 
It's all right, David, she said again. But the shadows... His mother sighed softly. Tell you what, why don't you sleep with me and your dad tonight, okay? David felt weak with relief. Okay, Mom. David's father came back with a lit candle stuck to a plate. Flashlight's dead, he announced. I can't even remember the last time we used it. Well, said his mom, shall we go to bed then? I told David he could sleep with us tonight. David's father didn't say anything right away. Yeah, okay, he finally answered. Let's hit the sack. As the three of them walked past David's bedroom, he glanced in. It was there! Mom, he whispered, look, see the shadow moving? Honey, it's the candlelight that does that. David bit his lip. Then he nodded. Yeah, he told himself, it could be the candles. Still, he hurried into his room, his mom and dad's room. His dad set the candle on the bedside table. His mom lit another one and set it on the dresser. Mom, David asked, can we leave a candle lit? He saw his mother look at his dad. Don't you feel safe with us? She asked. David squirmed. Yes, but... Greg's story flashed through his mind. Just... Can we? He begged her with his eyes. Okay, honey. We'll leave one on in the dresser, okay? Thanks, Mom. David hugged her. Then he hugged his father, too. After a second, his dad hugged him back. His parents fell asleep quickly. But David was too frightened to sleep. He lay there watching the shadows. Did they move because of the unsteady candlelight? The occasional flash of lightning that lit the room drove them away. But only for a moment. They quickly came back, bobbing and weaving around the walls and ceiling. David watched as long as he could, but his eyelids grew heavy and he fell asleep. There was a noise. What was that? His mother start asked, startled. I don't know, said his father as he threw the covers back. David had also woken up, to, woken up at the sound, but his eyes were riveted to the candle. It had burned very low, almost to the base. Even as he watched, it began to stutter. His dad was out of bed and was try, tying a robe around his waist. His mother was watching anxiously. The shadows loomed over the bed. Then, the candle went out. David heard his father cursing as he looked for the matches. Hurry, Dad! David tried to shout, but it came out as a whisper. Hurry, he sobbed. Suddenly, a match flared. David saw his father standing by the bed. His father smiled at him. David's smile turned to wide-eyed horror as the hands of his father's shadow wrapped around his dad's neck. His father dropped the lit match and grabbed at the dark claws. David turned to his mother as a scream worked its way up his throat. His mother lay very still, a dark shadow where her face should have been. He whipped his gaze back to his father, who now hung from his shadow's grasp. David's mind seemed to explode in fear, and he looked up and screamed. In the last light of the dying match, he saw a child-sized shadow drop toward him from the ceiling. <laughs> oh, okay, that one. I got the goosebumps again. Yes, yes, yes. Super goosebump time. I wish it could... Yeah. <laughs> that was a good one. That was creepy. Get a little something to drink and see what you guys are saying. Yeah. Oof. All right. Let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, <laughs> Shane called it. Look. Okay. Let's see. Um. Tony Giannot said, will you continue to do this even after we're not in quarantine? I hope so. Tony, I, I, at this point, I'm starting to think this is going to have to be a thing I do. Uh, during the quarantine, I'm going to do it like every single week. When the quarantine's over, maybe we'll do a special thing every couple of weeks or every month or, or on Halloween night or something. We, we'll, we'll, we'll play with it. We'll have fun with it. It's not going to end because I'm having way too much fun. And uh, yeah, I'm just having way too much fun. Uh, let's see, uh, David, why does there have to be more Davids? Michelle, uh, said disappeared is not the same as viciously murdered. <laughs> well, says you, you're in Philadelphia. That's like where everybody's viciously murdered. Like you've been viciously murdered like eight times. 
Uh, David, unless you disappear to be viciously murdered. Ooh. Uh, Shane Migliavaca, blood on the walls. I'd pay extra for that house. <laughs> and then Shane said, darn, hope it's not shadow people. Well, uh, yeah. good news, bad news, mostly bad news. <laughs> um, uh, Morgan Moore, so a typical night in Ohio. Man, we have some weather out here, don't we? Uh, David said, uh, this story gives off the impression, David sleep, we don't. <laughs> uh, Shane said, dang, that was good. Or uh, Tony said, dang, that was good. Thank you. Morgan Moore, this is what I call a story, my favorite of the night. I'm so glad you enjoyed it so much. Uh, Diane said, good times. Thank you. Shane Migliaka, fun story. Well, of course you loved it, Shane, because you called the shadow people thing like that. Uh, Rebecca Randolph said, revenge of the Peter Pan's shadows. <laughs> and just like that, we are wrapping up another super fun, super spooky uh, Uncle Henny's campfire stories. I just, uh, I know I say stuff a lot. Um, like, and one of the things I, I have to continue to say is like, I just really appreciate that you guys hang out with me, even if you can only pop in for 10 minutes or if you hang out the whole two hours. It is so nice to have something to look forward to. Um, not to be super negative, but you know, most things are just kind of, they're just kind of not, they're just kind of not guaranteed. You know, they're just not guaranteed. I mean, eventually life will get back to normal, but for right now, it's like, you know, it's hard to plan to go to a concert. It's hard to plan to go. You can't go to the movies. You can't plan any of that stuff, but you can plan to sit in your, uh, in your studio lit creepy and tell scary stories and chat with your friends. Um, Tony uh, said, uh, Tony said, uh, sorry, I forgot not to curse. Oh, don't worry about it. If, if, if you curse, nope, I don't think kids are reading the chat. Um, but if you curse, I'll just, I just change it when I read it out loud, just to make sure we keep it nice and family friendly. But, uh, Tony said, I actually made it the entire two hours. Sorry, I couldn't make it last week. Don't feel bad. There's always more opportunities, always going to be more opportunities. We'll be, so keep in mind, my friends, keep an eye out. I'll be right here. Next Wednesday, 8 o'clock Eastern, we'll hang out. We'll read the other half of Scary Stories for Sleepovers. We'll hang out. We'll crack some whys, make each other laugh. And uh, I just really appreciate it. And again, I want to thank you guys, especially those who tipped. Um, I'm not going to get, like, highly emotional. But, you know, the fact that I'm going to, like, legitimately, you guys tipped me very, very generously to the point where, like, I'm going to buy groceries, with your tip money. Like it's enough money to feed me and my dogs, um, for a little while. And that's like amazing. And I just, I'm so thankful. And I'm, I'm, and I'm honored that I provided some entertainment to you guys that was fun and interactive and made you feel like it was worth, uh, uh, tipping so generously. Sincerely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, huge. Thank you. Uh, David Neuer, we appreciate you, brother. This is a good distraction every Wednesday. Uh, Craig Cohen said the stories are great and better when read by you so enthusiastically. Well, thanks. Thank you. I love reading out loud. It's, it's something that I've really, uh, come to realize I'm very passionate about. My mom used to read to me out loud and, uh, apparently, uh, it rubbed off, uh, Rebecca Randolph. This is so much fun. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you for, for not only, not only, you know, thank you guys for coming and watching and not only thank you guys for, for often tipping, uh, and for interacting, but also thank you guys for being enthusiastic, for sharing on Facebook ahead of time, saying like, I can't wait for the next one, for sending me messages saying, I can't wait for the next one, for buying a t-shirt, for whatever you do, thank you for keeping me sane. So, uh, and let's see, Mark Shields said, thank you for taking our minds off the real world for a short while, my pleasure. And the same to you, because this takes my mind off of things too. And uh, I do want to mention again, if you guys... Um, uh, oh, Shane said, as the saying goes, we're in this together. Damn right. Pardon my French. Um, so I also want to mention again, if you haven't uh, checked out my podcast, I do a weekly um, story reading, which is actually from original authors. Uh, it's called Weekly Spooky. And every Wednesday, we already have 25 episodes out. Every Wednesday, you can hear a brand new story recorded professionally. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's completely free. So if you want something a little bit more adult head over to Weekly Spooky, and every week you'll get 20 to 30 minutes of fun content to make you feel a little bit more like it's Halloween when it's totally not yet. 
Um, Heather Fairchild, I listened to you read in my pitch black room with a candle lit so that last story had me shook. Man, I bet. I was actually... Um, there, uh, the house made a creaking sound while I was reading. It actually scared me really bad. <laughs> I'm going into my living room and turning on all of my lights and cuddling the dogs because I get creeped out too a little, little bit. Um, and Morgan Moore said, hopefully featuring me soon. Morgan, please uh, submit. When, whenever you have a story, submit it to Weekly Spooky. We'd love to read it and very likely uh, narrate it and let people hear it. So... Uh, on that note, my friends, again, thank you so much. We're, I'm going to take off and go. Um, let's be real. I've got to use the bathroom. That's a big, a big element. So I hope to see all of you next Wednesday. Um, but if I don't, I hope it's because you're busy doing things you love with people you love. So until next time, my friends, I am going to sign off.